All right. Right. Um, okay, great. Are you recording already? Well, I figured I'd start it because I couldn't screen share. Oh, it's 302, so this may be it anyhow. I may not get anybody else, so we'll just go. So do you- um, We give it till five after, just to- Okay, all right. I guess we can chop stuff off the beginning of the a meeting when we turn it into a YouTube video. To, yeah, I just figured we should have it up just in case. Mm -hmm. Now, Diana, who are you with? I I Hi. remember. <laughs> well, I'm a member of the Austin Bonds family. That was uh -huh. my great grandfather. And Clifford Bonds was my grandfather. But as far as organizationally, I'm with the Indiana Council on Educating Students of Color. I'm their uh, executive uh, director. Oh, and excellent. My family comes to Mitchell every year for a large family gathering in the park. I think I've been met you. To that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. We probably have met. It's been a while, I think, since anybody met in the park even. Did you guys do it last year? Oh, 124 people came from wow. Uh, wow. California, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois. How fantastic. Oh, yes, yeah, six different states. People showed up. Mm -hmm. uh, 124. Well, I we don't. Always, we always, uh, the, the, the park is not our first stop. We stop at the cemetery in Mitchell, and that's where there's five generations of the Austin Bonds family is buried, including Austin. But mm -hmm. uh, Austin was really um, a member of the Thomas family. His mother was a Thomas. And then her uh, grandparents were Roberts. I'm trying to think if we have any of those families in this presentation. Emily, I, I we do. There, there's a lot of little anecdotal stuff in this, so we'll see. Yeah, I don't think we do either, but the Roberts family, of course, is a very big deal. I mean, we've got a lot of Robertses. I don't know if, if Emily told you this, but we've been researching for a long time now and writing on a book about Lawrence County's African-American um, population in general, but the history <laughs> of going way back to um, Phyllis, the woman of color, I guess, is the first yeah, one. Yeah, 1818. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, it's the most interesting thing ever. I mean, just amazing things that nobody knew. And you know, as historians, it's wonderful to have new stories to tell. And we just got tons of them. Um, and I don't know how big our draft is so far, so far, but it's ridiculous. And it's in a county where nobody thought there was any story there. You know, we're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> There's a I was on the line with the with the Indiana Forestry last week, and with the uh, Historical Society, looking at um, Lick Creek. Mm -hmm. is what it's called now, but at one point, at the beginning of its history, it was called uh, Little Africa, mm -hmm. and that's where my family first came to Indiana back in 1810. Mm -hmm. But they were in uh, Virginia, Northampton County back as far as 1725. Wow. So we were able to, that's when the Roberts, the Roberts were the ones that came out of uh, Hampton County, Virginia, and out of Chatham County, North Carolina, mm -hmm. to Lake Creek or Little Africa, and started that settlement there. And the Thomases were already there. They came mm -hmm. in 1810. The Thomas the, boys were already there. Mm -hmm. There are quite a few, uh, instances of Lawrence County families, of course, marrying into that Lick, Lick Creek settlement and vice versa, married right. just between, because of course it wasn't very far. I mean, it was farther when you couldn't drive it in a car, but even then it wasn't that far. And these communities definitely knew each other or knew of each other and interacted. Um, so, well, Emily, perhaps we had better get started. It's, I think uh, so six after and if somebody comes in he can let him in but we'll just go ahead mm -hmm. and uh, and talk so 
Um, Diana, we'll just address you directly since you're here. Um, <laughs> but this presentation originally was supposed to take place last August. And for various reasons, it did not, including that we had a COVID outbreak at the museum. So we canceled the meeting and Emily got sick. She's up in, um, in uh, Milwaukee and had hoped to come down for it. That didn't happen either. So anyway, in the meantime, um, we did some more research and we had an event at, at um, well, right at the, the former front gate of Lehigh Cement in October, which was a historic walk about the death of a man who was killed, a black man named Harvey Hart, who was killed during a demonstration by uh, striking Lehigh workers. So that started us to think, and, and we had noticed for a long time, a real connection between Lehigh Cement and uh, settlement in Mitchell. Mitchell had a larger African-American population than Bedford, even though it's a much smaller town, as you probably know. And we think, um, at least anecdotally, it appears that Lehigh Cement had a lot to do with that. So let's get into this, Emily. Okay. Uh, Next slide. There we go. So um, Lehigh had been around for a while. Oh, but the Terrells. A, yes, you, you're familiar with the Terrells? Yes, I am. Excellent. Okay. Well, Lehigh Portland opened in Mitchell in 1902. And some of the environmental issues were obvious from day one. You know, you don't grind up uh, cement into gravel without making a big mess. And Paul Terrell, of course, uh, lived and had his own business right there, very close, which Emily's going to show us how close, I think, a little bit, very close to the plant. Um, so in October of 1907, after five years of this, he sued Lehigh Portland Cement Company. Um, and we found a couple, well, a newspaper article in two papers uh, talking about slush, sand, grit, and stone dust that had destroyed all the vegetation on his farm and made his farm worthless. Um, he said that the soil was ruined and he asked for $5,000. We never found out from the newspapers what happened to that lawsuit. We assume they, they settled out of court. Don't really know, but uh, that, uh, that tells us a little bit. And the picture is Lehigh as it appeared in 1910, which would have been three years after that. Mm -hmm. And you can just look at it and see what a mess it's making. And Lehigh was positioned pretty, pretty close to residential areas. It wasn't really far out of town. It needed to be close to its workforce, and it was. Uh, but of course, that you know that brought with it some issues too. Okay, next slide. My uh, grandfather worked at the Lehigh. Both of my grandparents did. Lots of people did. As a matter of fact, the slide it tells you exactly. Um, Lehigh employed a lot of non-white workers, and also I might have uh, a lot of non-native workers. They brought in um, laborers from Eastern Europe also. But yeah. in the 1910 census for Mitchell, out of a total population of 356 residents identified as black or mulatto, 71 of them are working at Lehigh, which is one out of five. Um, so there were 70 men and one so at one out of five, that's practically one in every household, you know, because households were pretty big at the time. And of those folks, 45 were laborers, 10, 10 were packers, nine were truckers, four were weighers, one was a timer, one was a tube mill boss, and one assistant engineer. So these were um, some, some skilled laborers as well. Um, not, I mean, obviously the, the bulk of them were labor is 45 that's more than half but still there were lots of people uh acting in a, a more advanced capacity and 13 of the families in that census that had lehigh employees owned their own homes yes so, that was my grandparents they lived on on first street mm -hmm. oh really excellent yeah so obviously that lehigh employment was a you know was a good step up for the families who who were able to secure it interesting thing we saw was six boarding houses that were owned by people of color housing 38 um, black lehigh employees most of those were young men and in the picture we have another view of what that plant looked like 
with the railroad tracks and, and all of that. That would have been a really busy corner of town. Oh, what was okay, that? Emily? May What's I, that? May I ask a question? Yeah, sure. sure of where was that plant located on what street? We have a map here yeah. in a second. Um, basically it was it was Main Street if you travel the bus right. of downtown on Main Street. But Emily will show you it, it took up a big a big chunk there. But their um, their main gate was like Main Street ended it. Was it first? Yeah. Emily was that the, the, the cross street? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank my, my okay. Live at 222 first. So they were very close. Yes. As a matter of fact, if, if we don't have them on the map, it sounds like we should <laughs> <laughs> write that down, Emily, 222 first, because sometimes the census doesn't give you an address. So now I'm, I'm turning this over to Emily to talk about her map and the work that she did. This is a, a modern map, mm -hmm. but, but the locations marked are from... They're from right? a 1918 map. Um. I guess I'll start kind of, this is Lehigh right in here. This area, that's kind of the big open field. And this is Lehigh today. Over here? Yeah. I'm looking, I'm, the map is small, but I'm trying to enlarge it so I can see. see. On this, oh, there we go, there we go, I can see better, okay. Yeah, so, where is Maine? This is Warren here. So East Main kind of dead ends at the office of Lehigh. Um, it ended here, okay. Yeah, there used to be buildings and things through this part. And then they had this part. All of this is new since the time period. Is Lehigh still there today? Mm -hmm. They just expanded. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, when you, when you go back to Mitchell, you'll be impressed. I'm gonna see that, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, to start with somebody we had just mentioned, Paul Terrell had his brickyard and house up in this area. Mm -hmm. So just north of where Lehigh was at the time. Where is First Street at? First is, let's see. Right there. You've got your. Yeah. Yeah. This is First. And it was right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My Some God. of the streets were longer. Hmm. before than they are now. Okay. Uh, this place is where Charlie Duncan lived and he was a trucker at the cement mill um, who owned his own home. This point here is where Dunbar School was. Um, it was an African-American school right. for many years. It closed in 31 or 1930 yeah 1931 the spring of 31 and it didn't reopen um mainly because of the depression not because of desegregation and then mitchell the high school was never segregated so it seems to have been less of an issue for most of lawrence county our next point over this one right here it's the African Baptist Church. Yeah, AMA or the Baptist Church? I think it's the Baptist. Or did I skip one? I may have skipped one. No, I did skip one, sorry. That is Leif Allen. Leif Allen was a musician. Um, he was kind of an interesting guy. He had an orchestra at one point. Then the Baptist Church. Now that's where my grandfather went. But my, no, my grandmother went to the Baptist church. My grandfather went to the AME church. Hmm. Yeah, we actually have been planning to do some research on the churches. Go looking for records and things. This is probably, those records may be accessible through the seventh, or the CDLB, the seventh district of the AME church. It seems like at one point we tried um, through the, you know, the district and didn't get anywhere, but we'll try. I don't think and, we ever got quite there. Yeah, well, I think I we remember, tried to Bloomington to see, talk there. There was some university that had a lot of AME records. Yeah. Um, 
anyway, it's something uh, we want to get back to. One of my first cousins is an AME minister. Really? Yes. He was minister. He just retired. He was a minister in Marion. And in, and at one point in Bloomington, I'll ask him. But he knows that there was a um, an AME church in Mitchell that was pretty well documented because mm -hmm. my family members were funerals were was at that church. That was it was a pretty active church, the yeah. Mitchell church. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have the <laughs> I have obituaries mm -hmm. of those that were have deceased, but whose funerals was at the AMA church. Really? Mm -hmm. That'd be that'd be cool to see. Yeah. Yeah, I have um, that. And we're always looking for more records. The more we can document, the better off this book is yeah. going to be. Now, for the benefit of anyone who's watching this later, who's not here at the moment, we should probably explain that AME stands for African Methodist Episcopal Church. Correct. And that's what this kind of turquoise highlighted one is. So this is the AME Church. That's the AME, okay. Yep. And actually, this point down here mm -hmm. is the house of Lulu Knight and Mary Sims, who are daughters of an AME minister, Aaron H. Knight, um, who we've documented quite well. <sighs> Let's see, who else do we have left? I lost my African Baptist church. Oh, here's African Baptist. Yeah, that's where my that's where my grandmother went. But on Sundays they split. He went to the AME. She was stayed with the Met with the Baptist Church. That's that's pretty great that each of them stuck with their own. They stuck with their own church. Church is great, but and thirteen kids, so they were fine. But they just did not. Uh, the AME Church was is is all. I am a member of the AME Church. So I can say this. It's a pretty um, more or less based on the Church of, of um, uh, England. Very, uh, very organized, very structured. Music. More ritual. Yeah. Uh, Baptist Church is not as structured as the AME Church is. I'm a Methodist myself, so that doesn't <laughs> surprise me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Emily. Okay. Continue. And our final point down here is the home of, oh, we missed one. Oh, well, that's the home of Walter and Henry Clements at different points. So this is where um, Levi or Speedy Clements lived. You I said Lunt, B-U-N-T? C-U, his last name is C-L-E-M. O N S. Clemens. Clemens. Yeah, and the Clemens family were here for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were. Yeah. Fact, they're buried next to the Bonds family. Are they really? Yes, and there are Clemens here in the city that I do know that are from Mitchell, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint. Okay. okay, yeah, picking up, um, we thought it was worthwhile to talk about the cost of working at Lehigh for, um, for some people. And, and, you know, obviously there were accidents that took place um, that impacted white people also. But these are members of the Black community who died as a result of accidents at Lehigh. Um, Henry Ice, um, this was in 1912 was caught between a couple of gypsum cars. Um, God, there's a Wigington. You yeah. saw George Wigington, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, we used to, when I was small, we went to Mitchell. We've been coming now for 65 years. Wow. Family reunion. We meet it at the cemetery. When I was small, we always went to Mr. Wigington's home. Um, it wasn't George, that wasn't his name. It must have been a brother. But he had two girls, Anne and uh, I can't remember the other girl's name. We have that family pretty well documented in our draft. Yeah. Although our draft uh, ends a little early, you know, 
time-wise um, for the people you remember. We didn't follow everybody through to the present. But I, I think I know those two girls because we've seen them in yearbooks and things mm -hmm. like that. The, the oh, wig, no. yeah. Wigington's are really an interesting family too. I was at a museum in Minneapolis and found out about a, a black man named Wigington who was quite a prominent um, architect and had designed any number of uh, impressive buildings all over the Midwest. So that was cool. I think he was from St. Louis, but anyhow. Um, so George, George uh, left behind eight children, unfortunately, but the um, obituary was quite, was quite nice, um, calling him honest, industrious, and economical. Um, so yeah, these were, these were unfortunate. These were the only two we found um, but out of a total of 75 people working there, that's a pretty high percentage, you know. Well, the Wigginsons and the Bonses were very close. Were they? Yeah, my grandfather and Mr. Wigginson played baseball together on the colored baseball team. So we've, we've been with that family over the years for, and uh, for a long, long time. And same way with the Clemens family. Mm -hmm. We had an article about that baseball team that was in the museum window at one point. I don't remember, you know, we did these posters a few years ago and we had an exhibit and that was one of the, one of the articles. Anyway, next slide, Emily. Okay. So the first person we wanted to talk about was a, a man named Samuel David Ice. He is the brother of the man we talked about earlier who died in the accident at Lehigh. Um, he came from Jefferson County, Kentucky, born in 1879. I'm gonna was, step away for a minute. I got, I'm going some soup. Hold on, I'm gonna go cut it off. Okay, I'm back. All righty. Uh, okay, so so Samuel Ice. So he he moved to uh, Marion Township, which is the township as you probably know that Mitchell is in. And in uh, the nineteen ten census, he's married. He has two children, and he's working at Lehigh. Um, he's got four more kids between nineteen ten and nineteen twenty, and then in the nineteen twenties, he's got two more. So uh, it's a total of eight. Uh, children all together, and they're living in a rented home in the 1920 census, described as west of the Monon. Um, Emily, did we figure out anything more about that address? We just know that the Monon was the north-south railroad that kind of went down Fifth Street in Mitchell. So, so that would have put him in the same neighborhood as everybody else, basically, no. depending on how far north or how, how far south he was. Kind of, he's quite a ways west of everybody else. Was he? Yeah. Was he west of the plant? No. No. Well, he's completely west of, he's west of the city. Wait, west or east? West. Toward 37. Yeah. That way. Okay. All right. Anyhow, to get back to Mr. Ice. There was an interesting article in the ninth, in January 20th, 1927, Mitchell Tribune, um, which talked about the fact that his house caught fire. And because it was beyond the city limits, the Lehigh firefighters came out and put it out instead of the city firefighters. Um, in 1930, he's still at Lehigh. He's still married. He's got five sons and two daughters. And in a very strange sort of article in 1933, the Mitchell Tribune reports that he can carry a sack of flour on his head with his hands in his pockets. Hmm. Um, the Mitchell papers are kind of fun to look at. You never know what's going to show up in them. But what we found interesting about Reverend Ice starts um, with this article in the Mitchell Tribune in 1935 that he's preached a sermon in the recreation hall at the CCC camp at Spring Mill. And the Ice Quartet, which of course would be, I assume, four people by the name of Ice, including him and a 
three of his sons or maybe all, all of them, all four of his sons or something, um, but that they had performed at this, uh, at this church service. And I was so hoping we would find a, a picture of this, but we never did. Spring Hill has a ton of pictures they're still going through. Uh, and there are quite a few photos of the CCC camp, which we're gonna show a couple here in a minute, but we never got one of, of Reverend Ice. Um, where my grandfather worked, he he was a, worked in the CC camp. Did he also? Wow. Um, I I wondered where they drew workers from. I'm sure that information is out there someplace. But um, but anyway, that rolled in the way that the 30s rolled into the 1940s. Um, the CCC camp rolled right into World War II. Yes, and Samuel Ice had three sons who. Um, enlisted in the war, two of them, uh, Lawrence and William, who fought in Italy, um, and then another one who managed somehow to stay stateside the whole time. Uh, they were with the 99th Fighter Squadron, and uh, that unit is credited with shooting down 12 Nazi planes in two days. So obviously they were doing good, you know, good work for the, for the country. Um, he unfortunately died in 1945, uh, while his sons were still at war, so he didn't get to see his sons again. Next slide, Emily. This is, these are pictures of that that CCC camp, the segregated CCC camp at Spring Hill. Uh, we don't know exactly, but we believe that they were side by side the camps, and that they may have even shared some facilities. But you can see there's a pretty rudimentary operation. Nothing real. Uh, Lux about it. Next slide, Emily. And we we found these photos of the Ice Brothers, the three of them. The first two, William and Lawrence, are the ones who fought overseas. And you can't really read um, the text on it. I just noticed, but uh, they they were well decorated. Um, with ribbons as a result of their service. And then the third one is, I don't know whether that's Solon or Solon, but anyway, a third of the brothers who who uh, enlisted and it just said he was in Fort Belvoir, Virginia, Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. I can't read the whole thing, somewhere in New York. So he did, apparently didn't leave the country. Next slide, Emily. So, the next family we wanted to talk about is the Ash family. Diana, had, had you heard of the Ashes? No, uh, no, they, I had they, not. They, they were, they're an interesting uh, story too. Thomas was born in 1857 in Anderson County, Kentucky. Um, so he was enslaved on the plantation of a man named Charles Ash and he married Eliza King in Kentucky in 1885 and moved to Mitchell around 1890. He was a brick mason for Lehigh, according to the 1910 census. They had six children, and he was not only a member, he was the treasurer of the United Brothers of Friendship, which was a fraternal organization active there in Mitchell. Um, Thomas Ash was interviewed by the WPA about his experiences under slavery and that interview is on is actually on the internet. You can Google Thomas Ash and find him. Thomas Ash slave narrative. Um, continue, Emily. So here's another fire. There seem to be a lot of fires happening. Um, this is in 1901 when a fire broke out, and 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 we know from this that he lived in South Mitchell. It says, but for the manful work of the neighbor women, the building would have been quickly consumed. There were no men in that end of town at the, at the time, and the women worked like heroes. So again, uh, the, <laughs> the Mitchell papers. Go and ahead. That happened, that happened in 1901 to my grandparents' home and burned down. The first one did. There were a, a lot of fires. Yeah, and yeah. you hope you hope it was just because the houses were. Um, wood and you know everybody had either coal burners or wood stoves or whatever um well and we talked to the non-official mitchell historian he said that there was no fire department at that 
point either. Oh, Mopar department. Okay. Yeah. Just Lehigh. Was oh, that it? No, Lehigh wasn't even there. When when was the other fire that that Lehigh showed up? Nineteen twenty seven. Oh, that was a lot later. Okay. Yeah. 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 So so you just had to take care of these things yourselves, and evidently the women in that part of the town were very capable. So go girls. Okay, a kind of sad but not tragic story that appeared in 1917 is that one of Thomas Ash's sons picked up a revolver and, and accidentally shot himself, um, but they thought he would recover. And I, I'm not sure, did we figure out which of the sons this was? I think we did, but I can't remember at this time. But he did have a long and productive life, so it's so... You know, um, that was just another odd story. And then the, probably the oddest story of all is from October 1931, in which Thomas Ash, um, in competition with a guy who brought in a gourd that was 27 inches long, he, uh, he brought in one that was four feet and five inches long. And uh, there was a joke about it being a baseball bat used in the recent World Series. Um, go ahead, Emily. Okay. I guess what that does show is, is that they were practicing agriculture. So then um, some of their kids, I don't think we're going to talk about all of them. But their daughter, Etta, married Leif Allen, Lafayette Allen. And that's the one that Emily showed us where he lived. He was a bar rent musician. And then their son, Lewis, um, married a woman named Anna, Emma Cooper and then moved to Muncie and then came back to Mitchell and married Rosetta Clements and worked at Lehigh. And a lot of this group moved to Muncie. A lot of them completely relocated to Muncie and never came back. And there were actually any number of, of white Mitchell, Mitchellites, I don't know, what do we call people from Mitchell, um, who moved to Muncie as well. Um, Emily and I ran into it so much, we called it the Mitchell to Muncie pipeline. It just seemed like something people did. I'm not clear why. You're drawing, you're drawing for me a connection to my grandparents who took me to Muncie when I went to Ball State. They drove me up and took me to see people in Muncie that were from Mitchell. Yes, excellent. Yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I'm drawing some connections now. Okay. I assume it was because you could get good work in Muncie, you know, the Ball brothers and, and, right. I mean, Emily and I have researched a whole lot of M Mitchell people and probably some Bedford people too, but people who ended up in Muncie and, and uh, where they worked and what they did. It was, it, it, I think, possibly more common than people moving to Indianapolis. And of course, people did that as well. But uh, lots and lots, especially from Mitchell, people moving to Muncie. And in the Harvey Hart story that we told um, in the Halloween, not Halloween walk, but in our October historic walk, that the guy who was the, the Mitchell of mayor, the Mitchell, mayor of Mitchell, wow, at the time of that murder, ended up moving to Muncie and he ran for mayor of Muncie and he enlisted the help of some of these, these same folks we're talking about. Emily, do you remember which one he, he asked the to help him campaign. Anyway, there was one guy who was prominent in the Republican Party in Muncie. I think it was a guy who had the grocery store. Yeah. Even William Frederick Parrott. Oh, well, we're going to do Parrott. So if that's it, yeah, I think you're right. Okay, moving on. Oh, no, I didn't talk about that picture, but that was just a, a card. <laughs> uh, okay, moving on with some of Thomas and Eliza's more interesting children. There was their daughter Gertrude, who, if you, I don't know if you can read the small print on the newspaper article, but she was described as a woman of bad reputation in a divorce case in 1915, and she was ordered to leave Mitchell, um, which she did, and she married a man named Robert Fairchild in Monroe County, and had a pretty normal life from all we could see after that. And then there was their son Alonso. Um, who married a woman named Mary Eva Floyd. He worked for Lehigh and then he moved to Muncie and he worked for Marhofer in Muncie. And I believe he's the one who worked for 40 years or something at Marhofer. He was there for a long time and got 
recognized for his long and faithful service much, much later in time. <laughs> and then there's the Parrott family. So Lewis Parrott was enslaved in Taylor County, Kentucky. And in April of 1865, he walked off of uh, I don't know if it was a plantation or what the place uh, he lived. He just walked off and enlisted in the Union Army in the 125th USCT um, without asking permission. And he was somebody cook. And he moved to Lawrence County then after the war. And he shows up in 1870 in the census in Spice Valley Township, which is west of Mitchell. Right, next township over out in the, you know, out in the country with his wife, Sarah, the former Sarah Vaughn and eight children. And all of the kids were born in Kentucky also. So the whole family came up here. Um, he, as far as we know, he didn't work at Lehigh. He was listed as a laborer in the 1880 census. Um, and then he died before 1889. Um, we know that because his wife filed a request for a widow's pension from the military. And then his wife, Sarah, died in 1909. So she outlived him for, what is that, 20 years um, at the age of 82 and was described in the obituary as a faithful and conscientious church member who would almost certainly go to heaven. Well, that's nice. <laughs> um, their son, one of their sons, William Frederick Parrott, who was born around 1875, shows up in the 1900 census as a railroad laborer. And the railroad was another big employer of um, people in general and uh, African-Americans in Mitchell. We ran into a whole lot of uh, um, folks working for the railroad, including, again, these, these rooming houses full of people. Um, so William Frederick graduated from Mitchell High School in 1892. And the unofficial historian of Mitchell said he may be the first black graduate of Mitchell High School. 1892 is really early. He married Lula Brown in 1900. Yeah, yeah. Married Lula Brown in 1900. And in 1904, he became the teacher at Dunbar School. Um, <clears throat> in 1908, he sold his home on the east side of Mitchell. And guess where he moves? Let's see. <laughs> and, and he became the proprietor of the only African-American grocery store in Muncie, active in the Republican Party. And he's the guy I was talking about who was enlisted to help in the campaign of this guy from Mitchell, who it was an unsuccessful campaign, but anyway, he gave it his best. And we have the death certificate of William Parrott up here, um, which we're not talking about his death yet. So that's kind of a strange placement, but... Uh, when did he die? I can't read it. Anyhow, moving right along. Now we get to switch again. Oh. Get the colorful people. Well, we'll never know when he died because <laughs> <laughs> we didn't include it. Go uh, ahead. <clears throat> yes. And I've got two colorful families to talk about. I've got Perry and Maria Clemens Johnson. Maria was born in Orange County in about 1833. She told a story of hiding from the Confederate soldiers who were coming north looking for horses, cheating locals out of them. She married Perry Johnson in Lawrence County when she was 55 in 1887. In the 1900 census, they're living in Monroe Township. Um, Marion. Yes, sorry, Marion Township. Thank you, Monroe County. Um, Perry Johnson was quoted in November 17th, 1904, in the Mitchell commercial, as saying that Theodore Roosevelt would have carried every state in this union if he hadn't had dinner with Booker T. Washington. Perry Johnson died February of 1907. At this time, Maria was 74. And here's a picture of one of the pictures of Maria we have. We were so lucky to have them. After her husband's death, Maria continued to live in rural Marion Township near Mitchell. 
For a while, her sister lived with her. After her sister's death, she lived alone. She continued to cultivate a garden and support herself by selling produce for quite a while. Um, at about 100 plus, um, hmm. local officials discovered she was living alone in a small shanty. This is in 1937. At that time, I think she was about 104. They convinced her to move to the county infirmary where she smoked a clay pipe and made eggs from gunny sacks. Um, she died in 1944 at the age of 111. Yeah, this is just amazing. I mean, when I think about still planting and harvesting mm -hmm. vegetables and things and selling them to make a living at 100, right. I mean, I, I can't even imagine doing that at 80. I can't even imagine doing that right now. As a matter of fact, that's backbreaking work, you know? Mm -hmm. Amazing, this woman was amazing. Yes, she was. Yeah, there, there were nice articles about her. So we got a real feel for her mm -hmm. as a person. She's also said something about how she had cooked more meals for people than she, you know, ever wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. So I guess at some point earlier on, she cooked. Um, I think she cooked for the railroad laborers. Did she? Yeah, she I remember fed, her. fed a lot of people earlier in life. So anyway, Maria Johnson, amazing. Yeah, never liked to sit still apparently because she still worked when she was in the county infirmary. Hey. Yeah, <laughs> made rugs. Made rugs, did some chores. She was. <laughs> now that, interesting, I won't use infamous for Henry, Henry Skinner Cooper. Henry was born into slavery um, under the name of Henry Skinner in 1844 in Kentucky. In 1864, he enlisted in the Union Army in Camp Nelson, Kentucky, and mustered out in 1866. He appears twice in the 1870 census in Spice Valley Township. That's how that's coming in the Pettifords, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you've, you've read ahead, huh? <laughs> Go ahead. In Spice Valley Township with his wife Matilda or Elizabeth and a daughter. He's a farmer. By 1880, he is widowed and living with four children in Marion Township. He marries Phoebe de Prophet in 1882 and had six more children. Phoebe died in November of 1898. He is a laborer living on Oak Street in Mitchell with seven children in 1900. In 1902 to 1906, four of his children appear on the honor roll at school. And then, Pretty often, yeah. Yep. In 1904, he marries Melissa Pettiford and then the divorce in 1907. Um, this is Henry's Civil War pension. So you can see he first filed in 1882 himself. And then in 1931, his widow filed, which we haven't talked about his next widow, or his next wife, I should say. Um, can you go back to that, to that document one more time, the, the, the years of Kind of, you said he 1882, yeah, and then in 1931. Mm -hmm. The 1931 is a widow's pension. A widow. Okay. All right. Okay. 1882 was his invalid's pension. Mm -hmm. I guess he was injured in some way. Well, he was in artillery, so shells banging near your yeah, head. Did something explode? May have lost hearing for one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and here you can see where they call him Skinner Henry, alias Cooper Sk Henry. Um, the story about, of that was his father, his actual father's name, last name was Cooper. And so he chose to use that instead of the enslaver's last name. Okay. In 1903 and 1908, he was elected a junior warden of the Russell Lodge of the Masons, which is the segregate 
the it's all black mason's lodge yeah not familiar in 1909 he married his final wife cherry mccutcheon who was 27 years his junior had already been married to another man named cooper and had a son named willie in September 1921, the Mitchell School Board paid Henry $60 for janitorial services. He was 77 at the time. He was 77 and doing janitor work, so he's another um, mm -hmm. hardworking guy. <laughs> On August 21st, 1930, the Mitchell Tribune reported that Henry Cooper was the only surviving Civil War veteran of color in the county. Henry died December 6, 1930, and members of the Masonic Lodge and the American Legion attended the services in a body and tendered ritualistic services at the grave. And we thought it was kind of important to mention the fact that the American Legion was there. It hadn't been segregated. And here's Henry's obit. Um, <sighs> It's just from that, yeah, he we see that he was uh Baptist yeah. as well. Yeah, it's just kind of a nice positive obit. And now to go to ooh, his notorious son, John William Willie Cooper. Stepson, right? Well, it was his it's, it was his stepson, but as far as we can see, he pretty much claimed him as his son. He had the same last name. Yeah, may have been related. Um, may have been related. So Willie was born in Kentucky and moved with his mother to Mitchell in 1909 when she married Henry Cooper. He graduated from Mitchell in 1906. Um, there's slightly not nice comment on his yearbook bio that he'd always been a good boy and has enjoyed the privilege of occupying a front seat in order that his good habits might not be tainted. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, tainted, yeah. 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 I'm kind of, mm. pretty, pretty crappy um, comment. Mm -hmm. He registered for the World War I draft, but we can't find any evidence of him serving. After graduation, he also moved to somewhere in Michigan, and he was living in Gary, for Indiana, for a while. So the pool room. When Willie came back, he operated a pool room for his business. And at first, it was located on Mississippi Avenue, and later to Warren. Mr. Redding. <laughs> so the pool room opened in 1933 and was still around in 1941. It may have lasted longer. We just haven't found any evidence. There's a 1939, January 27th, 1939, article in the Mitchell Tribune that Willie was arrested for charge and charged with allowing minors to play pool in his pool room. He paid $50 in bond, but no trial date was set. Another article on September 12th, 1940, about a raid at Cooper's pool room. Tables and chairs were seized. Cooper, William Ice, Bob Redding, Clyde Chastain, and Clyde Chastain is white, and Fred Duncan were present at the time of the raid. Yet again, another police raid, May 15th, 1941, on uh, Willie Cooper's pool room. Yeah, I'm familiar it, with the uh, Chastain and, oh, yeah. with, and with the Redding family mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the Duncans. <laughs> <laughs> the, this raid on May 15, 1941 began with a search for a wanted man. When police knocked on the door, it was opened, shut, and locked. Subsequently, 50 to 60 people poured from the back and side doors of the establishment, one man carrying a slot machine. Willie was arrested on charges of possession of liquor for illegal sale and possession of a slot machine. He was released on a 
$400 bond, several other arrests for intoxication, and one arrest for parole violations were made. It's interesting to note that there are 50 or 60 people in the pool room, which yeah. is quite a large percentage. And we're assuming that it was not just African-Americans, that this was a mixed race group. Um, <laughs> again, another raid on this pool room. And this is in May 19th, 1941. 18 persons were arrested and had to be transported to jail by school bus. A number of chairs were seized and later identified as being on loan from Haverler Mortuary, which, why they loan chairs to a pool room. I and know. it's such an interesting detail, yeah, that that Willie goes to Haverly Mortuary and says, can I borrow a bunch of chairs? And they said, sure, <laughs> evidently. So. Yeah. Go ahead, Emily, sorry. <laughs> not a problem. Cooper pled not guilty to charges of operating a gambling house and possession of liquor without a permit. There were 22 pints of liquor that had been found in the truck of his car. He was released on a $500 bond, pled guilty to both charges and paid $60 in costs. And we have another raid, um, November 7th, 1941. He was charged with selling liquor without a permit. And after a widely reported, I was found guilty and given a 90 day sentence. What we don't know is why he couldn't get a permit. Mm -hmm. You know, what the, what the deal was. Um, because there were plenty of saloons in Mitchell. Mm -hmm. According to Jeff Routh, at one point, all of Mississippi Avenue was lined with saloons. So anyway, that may have been earlier than this. This is pretty late, but still yeah it may have been that they were trying to discriminate or it may have been he had a criminal record that we don't know about and couldn't have a criminal record if you wanted to get a license we don't know we don't know <clears throat> okay Rowena back to you for our last person well one thing we wanted to add about the Cooper family that we just thought was interesting was the son of Henry Cooper's daughter, Hattie, and a man named Henry Campbell was a young man named James Campbell, who went by uh, the name Jimmy Cooper, and he was a boxer, and he was quite a noted boxer. He trained with Joe Lewis in 38 and 39. He traveled with Joe Lewis's team to compete in Ontario, and when in 1941 he enlisted in the Army Air Corps, they put him to work coaching a very successful military boxing team at Smoky Hill Airfield in Kansas. So that is James Campbell and the photo is from the Muncie paper. This Muncie pug coach has a winning team. So even in Muncie, he was, he was coaching. Um, so we always like to point out, you know, when we have interesting people and celebrities. So that is all that we have for today, but just to give you an idea of what else there is to talk about with respect to Lawrence County and its African-American uh, population. Uh, we've got a picture here of Burley Mabry, who was, uh, he was from Bedford in World War I. This is uh, him with his unit. You can't see the rest of the unit. But we also have stories of Buffalo soldiers, jazz singers and musicians, Pullman porters, rough riders, professional athletes, racehorse drivers, doctors and beauty queens, just to name a few. And we're really looking forward to being able to present more of that at some point in the future. Thank you, you have been an excellent audience. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me.